Seriously. Remain standing for the jury. Everybody be seated, please. You may proceed, Ms. Figgis. Okay. I want to turn your attention to State's Exhibit 111. Did you take a buckle swab of Brandy Peters? I did, yes, ma'am. And what is a buckle swab? A buckle swab is where we just take that Q-tip I mentioned earlier, and we just swab the inside of the cheeks, the saliva of the cheeks, for any kind of DNA testing standard. So if they wanted to compare it to her, they would have her DNA on file. And you did this at the autopsy when you processed her body for all the other things you told us about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And do you see States 111 in front of you, her buckle swab? I do. Okay. Um, before the break, we talked about the recorded prints that you took of hers at the autopsy. Um, you told us how you took them. States Exhibit 103II, I believe. Are those now in front of you? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Can you hold those up oh, and show them to the jury? Yes. These were the fingerprints that I took of her, and they're kind of... My evidence label's on the front side, I'm sorry, but these are the palm prints that you can see kind of on either side. And then that way you'd have her prints for any comparison that you could make if you found a latent print of value in her home? Yes, ma'am. All right, so let's talk about the latent uh, prints in this case. You told us earlier that you processed that bathroom window where the screen was damaged for latent prints but did not find any of value, right? Yes, ma'am. Did you process um, anywhere else in the house for latent prints? Yes, ma'am, I did. Where all in the house did you look for latent prints? The latent print processing that I did was in the master bathroom window, the interior and exterior, the master bathroom door, and the toilet room door. I processed the interior and exterior. The hallway bathroom, the sink, the toilet area, the tub area, and the interior and exterior door. All three of the foyer walls in the main hallway where Brandy Peters' body was found, and the interior garage entry door. Okay. Um, were you able to find any of value? Yes, ma'am. Okay, where did you find latent prints of value? Um, the of value prints were located on the the bathtub faucet where the water comes out of it, not the handle, but where it's like the, the spout, I believe you can call it, where the water comes out, and also on the interior garage door handle. Okay, so looking back at 57D, can you show us with your laser in this photo where you found those latent prints of value in the hallway bathroom? Yes, ma'am. It would be right here on the top of that spout of the bathroom where the water pours out of. And were you able to um, do or do a comparison of the latent prints of value you found in the bathroom to the standards of Brandy Peters that you took at the autopsy? A comparison was done to Brandy Peters, yes, ma'am. Okay. And what were the results? It was identified to her palm. I believe it was her left palm. I'm sorry. It was her left palm. Okay. So her left palm was the latent print that you found on the bathroom, the hallway bathroom faucet. Yes, ma'am. Of the tub. Okay. And you said you found another one of value on the exterior door handle leading to the garage? The interior door handle. Interior leading door handle. Into. Yes, ma'am. Leading to the garage. Okay. <clears throat> and did you do the comparison on that? Um, or did you do any comparisons on that? No, ma'am. Okay. Uh, that was done by, I believe, your supervisor, Maltese? I don't know. Okay. Um, did you uh, impound into evidence all of the latent fingerprints that you processed in this case, whether they were of value or not? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And what do you see in front of you as State's Exhibit 129? This is the evidence envelope of the latent prints that I collected from the, the crime scene. Okay. So those are all of the latent prints that you found? Yes, ma'am. Okay. But the only two that were of value enough that any comparison could be made were on those two locations that you just told me about? Yes, ma'am. Okay. In all your processing of the home, in all of these rooms, um, throughout all of the items found, everything collected, was any cell phone ever located in the home? No, ma'am. Question this witness, and you have to kind of let things 
move along, she doesn't do some of the comparisons and other things. So she's doing a particular function to let it, you know, let the, let it progress. But anyway, do you, do you have a question? All right, we'll go sidebar. question from the jury was, um, uh, why did you not process the back door for prints? Is there any particular reason? There wasn't. We did the swabs for the the door handle of the interior and the exterior, so there were, there, there isn't. I actually don't have an answer for you. Any follow up, Ms. Duke? So on the front door and the, um, the back door, you swab each side of the door handle. Yes, ma'am. Interior and exterior. Okay. And then for, for the garage door, that's where you look for the latents. The, the door leading to the garage is where yes, you look for the latents. All right, thank you. Mr. Prince. All right, you can step down. Oh, your next witness. They call Caroline Perpendier and Wilder. Would you face the clerk and be sworn, please, ma'am? Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, ma'am. Have a seat, please, ma'am. May I proceed? Good afternoon. Can you introduce yourself to our jury and then spell your name for our court reporter, please? My name is Caroline Wilder. C A R O L I N E W I L D E R. And what was your name in November of 2010? Caroline Carpentier, um, C A R P E N T I E R I. Okay, and in November 2010, um, what were you doing at the time? Where did you work? I was a forensic specialist at the Tallahassee Police Department. Okay, and how long were you a forensic specialist with the Tallahass Tallahassee Police Department? Um, at that time, it was only a few months, but my career there was about eight, uh, eight years. Eight years, okay. Can you tell me a little bit about your education and training to work in the forensics department at TPD? Sure. Um, I attended Florida State University, and I got a bachelor's in uh, biophysics. Um, from there, I went to the police academy, got, some, uh, got my law enforcement standards. Um, I then got hired on at the police department in March of 2010, and um, there was a six-month very intensive in-house training program, and um, I was also sent to various uh, schools uh, around the state and country for different disciplines. Okay, and did you respond to a 908 Saddle Creek run on November 20th, 2010? Yes, ma'am. Okay, were you there with the forensics team that day to help process the scene? Yes, ma'am. All right, I want to turn your attention to a couple of items. That, uh, were you able to look at these items in front of you before court today? Yes, ma'am. All right, I want to first show you um, State's Exhibit, uh, the photos, 70 GGG through TTT. Yes. Are those photos, do they appear to be accurate depictions of um, the areas that you uh, collected evidence in the living room and exterior areas of the house? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Do you run by those letters one more time, please, Ms. Duke? 70 G, 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 G for good through T, T, T for Tom. All right, what do we see in G, 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 70 G, G, G? Um, G, G, G is um, near the front foyer area, the tile area uh, right here on the left side of the screen. Um, is directly in front of the front door, um, and then the carpeting right next to the tile. Um, and there was a uh, artificial tree um, right there in that area as well. What we see 
60 and 70 HHHH. I guess a zoomed in photo right between these two evidence markers. Yes, ma'am. Um, the same string that was seen in the previous one is, a, is right here. Um, and then directly in the middle of the photo, photograph, there was an artificial fingernail that was found. And then I, 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 what are we seeing here? That's the close-up of the artificial nail. And then J, J, J? Um, same close-up, but with a scale and with a numbered marker. And did, did you collect this artificial nail? Yes, ma'am. I want to turn your attention to the notebook in front of you. Um, the sleeve with uh, State Exhibit 88 inside. Yes, ma'am. What is State Exhibit 88? Um, suspected fingernail acrylic from carpet by turned over tree just past front entrance foyer. Okay, so that's the nail that you encountered in State Exhibit 88? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Looking at 70 KKK, what do we see here? Um, this is of that same area. Um, you can still see the tile in this bottom left and the carpet. And this was the tree as we found it, it was uh, turned over on its side. What do we see in LLL? This is more of a close up of the tree. Um, there was some suspected blood um, on the tree, and there was also a suspected um, what we thought to be a bullet hole in the, one of the branches. What about MMM? That is the closer up of that uh, hole right there with a numbered, scaled numbered marker right next to it. Got any um, that's a close up picture of the suspected blood that was on that same tree. And did you swap the suspected blood in this photo? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I want to um, take 86 in the binder. Yes. What is 86? Swab is suspected blood from branch of artificial tree that was turned over by the front door. What do we see in 70000? This right here is on the actually the exterior of the house. Um, this is, I believe, uh, the corner of the house. Uh, the door is further closer to the camera where I'm at. And there's a couple of um, suspected hairs um, just to the right of that front door area outside. It's a closer up photograph um, with a scaled numbered marker um, on the bottom. And looking in your binder at States 87, what is States 87? Hair from east wall outside a front door. And did you process the scene not only on November 20th, but also, I believe, two days later, you came back with your team to um, continue processing the scene? Yes much of a scene to be able to do it all in one day? Well, we wanted to make sure we could get everything okay. possible. Looking at 70 QQQ, what do we see here? QQQ, um, this is to the left of the front door area. Um, the front door would be just out of the frame here, um, and then this was the front porch area. There was some suspected blood found on the ground. And 70 RRR? Same front porch, um, and the suspected blood was in one of these shadows. That is the drop of suspected blood found um, just outside with a scaled numbered marker right next to it. Did you swab that uh, suspected blood? Yes, ma'am. Okay, um, in your notebook, if you look at State Exhibit 94, please. Swab of suspected blood from front porch area left of the front door. And what do we see in what do we see in seventy uh, U U U here? Um, this is from the outside looking into the garage area. Okay, so this would be taken in the garage and through this door would be the kitchen? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Did you collect any evidence from the master bedroom? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I want to turn your attention to, should be the, the package there closest to the jury, yes, ma'am. Exhibit 39. What is 
39. Miscellaneous paperwork from Master Bedroom Entertainment Center. Okay. And this was previously 39 A and B, now just 39. Can you open 39? Yes. Yes, ma'am. All right. Um, just want to show you the very front of 39. We'll look at the rest of it with, the, with another witness. Um, but does this appear to be the paperwork that you impounded from that you found in the master bedroom? Yes, ma'am. And where did you find this on the in the master bedroom? <coughs> um, this paperwork was found. Excuse me. Um, it was found in the entertainment center. Like on top of the entertainment center? I don't recall. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, turn your attention to the other package in front of you. What is safety exhibit 101? Trash bags from cabinet above drawer. Oh, sorry. From cabinet under above drawer. Okay. And so those are trash bags that you found there in the kitchen? Yes. Okay. Um, I want to turn your attention to a, a second set of photos in front of you. 130A through P. Yes, ma'am. Okay, are those um, photos of the home um, as they appeared the day that y'all processed it? Um, I don't recall the date the photographs were taken, but yes, okay. this is of the home. Okay, and it appears the same as when you processed it as photos? Yes, ma'am. Um, 130A uh, shows the inside of the uh, front door area um, and the foyer area. There was a lot of uh, broken glass and um, suspected blood. Um, this is post-processing. Um, we processed the scene with some chemicals to try to enhance any patterns um, that might have been seen. So this was just an overall of how it was after we processed. Okay. And then 130B is a photo of more of the patterns in the area leading from the door to the rest of the home? Yes, ma'am. Okay. And then 130C? Um, this is of that uh, front tile uh, area as well, just trying to uh, photograph any patterns that might have been there. 130D, an up-close photo of some of those patterns? Yes, ma'am. 130F? Same thing. And in 130G, what do we see here? 130G is also a close-up of those suspected patterns, but I have added in a, a scale. Um, I thought it could have been a shoe impression, possibly. Um, so in that case, we uh, put the numbered scale, or the uh, ruled scale down to be able to accurately uh, get the size later if necessary. So you're trying to document anything that could possibly be used in the future? Correct. Okay. Are a lot of these patterns kind of smudged and hard to make out? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Are you using a scale on, on every type of pattern you can find here? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is yet again of the front foyer area. The uh, tile is up here on the upper left, um, the upturned tree, and then more of the um, processing that we did with the chemicals. Did you try to use a scale on some of these patterns? Yes, ma'am. What do we see in 130M? This is um, actually the master bathroom area. Um, I'm standing in the master bedroom, looking into the bathroom um, on the floor. Um, there was what was suspected to be a shoe impression, or a possible. 
Um, so I took a, a photograph before any processing was done of that floor. This was of that possible um, possible shoe impression. I saw um, some marks on the floor that could have been, um, so I took a photograph of the impression prior to processing. And 130O? Uh, same thing, I believe. Okay, so these, these smudges that we see here in this photo photograph these and tried to process them thinking it could possibly be some sort of shoe impression? Possibly, yes ma'am. Okay. What do we see in 130P? This is um, after processing. Um, I used, um, it's called bichromatic um, powder. Um, it's the typical black powder that I'm sure you've seen on TV. Um, tried to powder and uh, lift any impressions that um, might have been enhanced. Um, and in this case, I didn't feel that anything got enhanced, but I took a photograph afterwards just to show what I could or couldn't find. So it wasn't enough to look to make any comparison, but you did photograph what you what you tried to process. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. No further questions. Okay. Uh, Ma'am, I just want to clarify, you were able to identify several possible footwear impressions that you took pictures of and, and measurements of during the course of your investigation, correct? Yes, sir. Um, you personally didn't feel that you could do anything with those, either compare them or identify a class or anything like that, correct? Well, I'm not a shoe wear examiner and, and never was, but I didn't feel, in my opinion, that they would be good for any type of comparison for those shoe wear examiners. And, and to clarify, you'd never been qualified at that time as an expert in footwear impression? Correct. Thank you. No further questions. Further, Ms. Speaker? No, sir. And maybe I ought to just clarify on that just from a legal standpoint. Uh, before somebody comes in and offers an opinion comparing things, they have to be what we call qualified as an expert. So what they're saying, that's not her uh, field of expertise. So she, she would not be allowed to try to make that kind of opinion. All right, you can step down. Thank you, sir. You want to keep her subject to recall? Huh? Yes. Okay. All right. All right, you'll be on call. Thank you, okay. sir. Good. Good. Next witness. Face the clerk and be sworn, please, ma'am. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you give in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. Good afternoon, Ms. Peters. Will you state your name and spell it for our court reporter, please? Monica Peters. <coughs> M-O-N-I-C-A. P-E-T-E-R-S. Okay. And how do you know Brandy Peters? Um, she's my sister. And who is um, Mary Rashad Williams? That's my mama. And she's also Brandy Peters' mom? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Does Miss Williams live here in Tallahassee, too? Yes, yeah, she lives in... Um, you don't have to give us her address, but she yeah. lives here in town? Oh, well, yeah. Okay. Um, and do you live and work here in Tallahassee as well? Yes, ma'am. All right. Now, before uh, Miss Brandy Peters passed away... Did the three of you, you, Miss uh, Brandy Peters, and your mom, Mary Rashad Williams, did y'all see each other or talk on a daily basis? Yes, ma'am. All right. And were you and your mother very active in Brandy and her children's lives? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Were the twins supposed to be actually staying at your mom's house the night of this incident? Yeah, they was. Okay. Now, did you used to live with Brandy Peters and her children? Yes, for a little while, when I first moved back here. 
I'm sorry, ma'am. I think you, would you I mind? Said, you would, I said yes for a little while. All right. So if you would move forward a little bit, a little okay. bit further, I think we'd hear you better. Okay. Probably because I got <clears throat> congested too, so. So you said you lived with Brandy Peters and her children for a little while? Yes. What's for a little while? A few um, years, few months, few weeks? Probably a couple months or so. A few months, okay. And in your experience with living with Brandy and her children, um, what time did they typically eat dinner? Mm, usually around 5, 6 o'clock. Okay, so kind of an earlier dinner time yeah. as opposed to later? Okay. And were you living with them, though, on November 19th, 2010, the day of this incident? No, ma'am. Okay. Um, how long did Brandy live at her Saddle Creek Run home? Well, I think it's two, three years, two years or so. Are you aware of any damage to Miss Peters's um, window screens there at her home or any of them? Um, yeah, she did have a rip in one of her screen windows in, I think it was in the master bedroom somewhere can't really remember. Okay. Um, was that window screen damaged prior to the day of this incident, November 19th, 2010? Yes, ma'am. Okay. How long had it been damaged? Um, since she moved in that house. Since she moved in, you said? Yes. Um, was that house at Nino Creek, Saddle Creek Run, uh, was that public housing that your sister was qualified to live in? Yes, it was Section 8 house. It was Section 8 housing? Yes. Okay. Um, what type of car did, did Brandy drive? She didn't, she didn't own a car at the time. The car that she had that she owned it, um, was actually broken and needed an engine in it. She had a grand, uh, Pontiac Grand Prix. Pontiac the, Grand Prix? The car that was actually in her yard, that car belongs to, to my mama, and they would just allow her to use it. Okay. So the only car that she has is one that doesn't belong to her, and you said belongs to your mom? Yes. And it's a car that your mom was allowing Brandy to use to get around? Yes. Okay, and it's a Pontiac Grand Prix? No, it's uh, oh. um, the car that my mom allowed her to use was the Burgundy um, Chrysler Concord that was in the parking in the driveway. Oh, okay. All right. <clears throat> was that car sometimes broken down and you'd have to give her rides? Yeah, early in that week it was broken down. I think the water pump or something was wrong with that car early in the week. Okay. Um, so let's talk about November 19th, 2010. Did you, oh. I'll show you a photo that we saw earlier today in state 6A. <coughs> Is this that car you were talking about that your mom allows her to use? Yes. Okay. So this is kind of what Brandy uses as her car. Yes. All right, going back to November 19, 2010. Did you see Brandy on November 19, 2010? Yes, I did. All right, tell me about that. Um, what About what time of day did you see her and where? Um, it had to be around 4-ish, sometime in the evening, because I was just getting home from work. I had just pulled up in the yard, just got home, and uh, she came over with my mom. And um, so they had blowed, and I went over to the truck, and um, they said they was going to pick up the kids. I'm okay. sorry, I'm, I'm congested. I can't really, I'm really not talking a lot, but uh, she said they was going to pick the kids up from school. Okay. And um, she had asked me, did I want to ride? And I told her, so, no, I'm just getting home. I'm tired here. I don't want to go or whatever. She said, well, I'm going to take her around here and pick the kids up, and then I'm going to drop her off back home. Okay. And, um, and so the the kids, I guess they were, in, I guess, well, the girls were in school at the time, elementary school? Yes. Okay, and Javante was in some, some type of uh, preschool program, or? Um, yeah, he was going to Vaughn Head Start. Did they, did they go to aftercare after school? Yes, the twins did. Twins went to aftercare. And so um, what time would they typically get home from school? Um, school usually, I think school turned out around, at that point, like 2.50, 3.50 or something like that. So usually around 4 or 5, 4 or something, 5 o'clock in the evening, maybe. Okay, so they'd get home between 4 and 5, and then you said eat dinner between 5 and 6? Yes. Okay, and their aftercare program, they'd stay at that from the time school let out to the time okay. that Brandy went to pick them up? Yes. All right. 
All right, so after you um, saw them, were you trying to get a hold of her later that night? Yes, I did. <clears throat> usually, um, well, my daughter was crying because usually my daughter liked to go over there. My, my baby daughter, Mariah, she's 13 now, but then she was a lot younger. She always loved to go over there, and she kept worrying me about going there. And I told her, I said, well, I kept telling her, I said, well, I'm going to call her. And I think that was probably around a nine-ish or something. I tried to call her or whatever, and she didn't answer the phone. The phone was going to the voicemail. Okay. And um, so I told Mariah, I said, well, she told me. I said, she told me she's going to come get you. But I kept trying to call her, and she didn't answer the phone. And um, my mom had called. It had to be around nine-ish, ten, something like that. And she called me and asked me, did I speak with her? And I told her, I said, no, I didn't. I said, I tried to call her phone a few times. And she didn't answer, it's going to the voicemail. And she said the same thing with me. I tried to call in the phone going to the voicemail. And she said that, <clears throat> well, she may be over at CC house and she didn't realize her phone went off, or went, her phone turned off or whatever. Because it's never usually like her to turn her phone off. Like so that's she, like, she keeps her phone on 24 seven. So for her phone to just be off all night mm -hmm. is, it's not, you know. So by the time you and your mom start calling her at 9, it's going straight to voicemail. Going straight to voicemail. And that struck y'all as very unusual, you're saying. Yeah, it, it did, but I didn't, I thought my mom was like, well, she thought maybe she was at CC house. Okay. We didn't, I mean, I didn't really too much, put too much thought into it. So you're thinking, you're not thinking she was murdered. You're thinking, well, maybe she went to see somebody. Yeah. Okay. And then um, you said she's always one of those people that has her phone on her, though? All the time. Okay. Um, and the phone number that you were you trying to call her cell phone is that the number you were her trying cell to call? Phone. Was that number at the time five oh nine eight one seven one? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, did you ever call her home phone that night? Well, as I know, the home phone was off. If I think, if I'm if I'm not mistaken, that phone was not workable at the time. I think it had been disconnected. So, like, she didn't even she hadn't paid her service for it to have it working. Yes, ma'am. So you never even were trying to call a home phone because it was out of no, service. You were only calling a cell phone. Yes. Her cell phone. Okay. <clears throat> so you said your mom was calling you at 9 or 10 saying, I can't get a hold of her. Did you eventually go to sleep that night? Yes, I did. I think it was around, because, more, because I think it was around about like, yeah, about 11. Because I think the kids, if I'm, I can remember we had to do something that morning. Mm -hmm. Early in that morning hour, I know I had to do something with the kids. I think it was something at the uh, field trip or something, but I can't really remember. And I know her kids was going to go. And I had called her, and I um, got up that morning, probably about 5 or 6, and tried to call her again. And <clears throat> the phone was going to the voicemail. And um, I called my mama, and I told her, I said, well, I was trying to call Brandy. And I said, the phone's still going to the voicemail. She said, yeah, I got up early, too, trying to call her. It was going to the voicemail. She said, well, hold on. Give me a moment. Let me call Cece. She said, I got CC phone number. And um, she said, I'll call you right back. So I said, okay. So she got on the, I guess she called CC. Apparently, she had to. So um, she, she called me back and she said, CC said she's at work, but she's going to get her son to go over there and knock on the door and tell Brandon to call you. And I said, okay. Okay. And um, so, this so, is, so Cece's going to send so, her son to go check on Brandy. This is the Saturday morning? Yeah, this is okay. early Saturday morning. Um, so then, um, she had called me and I told her, I said, well, okay, well, when he come back, just call, to, I said, well, maybe she'll call. Mm -hmm. But, um, my mom called back and said that Cece said yep. that her son said he seen blood on the door. Right. And I'm like, blood on the door? So that's when I kind of like freaked out, throwed all the kids in the car mm -hmm. and drove over there. Right. I, well, I called my brother cause he lived kind of around the corner. Mm -hmm. Um, while I was calling him while I was headed over there and I got there. And I seen all the blood on the door, and like seconds with me, with Mendison with me pulled up. My brother pulled up. Okay, and I'm sure after that point, it was pretty emotional that day. Yeah, everything just yeah, a blur probably. You know, like, <laughs> yeah. Okay. It was like a nightmare. So after that, um, after you see Brandy that day, you said she was supposed to come over and pick up your daughter Mariah to go play with her kids. Did that ever happen? Oh, no. She never came over? No, she never came Did over. she ever answer your phone calls that night or call you back? No, ma'am. Okay. Not at all. That's all. Cross. 
Ms. Peters, <clears throat> do you recall telling uh, uh, Officer Jernigan on uh, November uh, 20th that you last communicated with your sister, Brandy, on Friday, 11-19 at 10 p.m.? No, sir. I might have told her. I tried to call her, and I, when the time when I was writing that statement, I could have been, I could have probably been passed out of my mind. But <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm trying to write a statement, and my sister and her kids just, just being murdered. I just found them murdered in the house. I mean, yeah. I mean, I don't remember recalling telling her because I know for facts that I didn't talk to her that night. It was no way possible that I could have talked to her that night. So I, I, I mean, maybe if I wrote on the paper, maybe it was saying that I spoke with my mom around 10 ish, 9 ish, 10 or something, and I told her that I tried to call her but didn't talk to her. Maybe that was the, what I was intended to write, and maybe I misinterpreted what I was writing with being overwhelmed and emotional. That could have possibly been the case. Uh, I'm not asking you um, what you wrote. I'm asking you, do you recall? No, sir, I don't. Okay, no further questions. Redirect. Would it refresh your recollection to see a copy of the sworn statement that you gave to yes. police? Just read it to yourself, and then she'll ask you a question. Tell, tell us when you're through reading, please. Okay, I'm, I'm done reading. Wait a minute, Finish. that's not a question. Just tell us when you're through reading. Okay, I'm through reading. All right, Ms. Dugan, do you have a question? Did that refresh your memory about what you told police um, about when you and your mom may have last time talked to Brandy? Yes. Okay. What did you tell police about when you mentioned 10 or 9 p.m.? Um, I told them, I said I had talked to her. It was about, I talked to my mom. I was telling them that I had talked to my mom about um, 10 or 9 p.m. And um, I told her that Brenda didn't answer the phone. Okay. So what you said in this statement was that your mom called to see if you had talked to Brandy at 9 or 10 p.m. Mm -hmm. That's what you said yes. about 9 or 10 p.m. Okay. You never talked to Brandy at 9 or 10 p.m. No, I never talked to Brandy at 9 or 10 p.m. Okay. And in your police interview a couple days later, you never told them you talked to Brandy at 9 or 10 p.m.? No. Okay. Um, and you told us the last time that you saw her, spoke to her, was late that afternoon before she was going to pick up the kids. You said sometime four-ish, between four and five? Yes, ma'am. Fair to say you'd remember the last time that you talked to your sister before she mur she was murdered? Mm, that was frankly the last time we had a conversation, if I can recall. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any juror have a question of this witness? All right. You can step down. Go side part. All right. So we're going to break for the evening. Um, don't discuss the case with anyone. Don't let anyone discuss it with you. Don't watch any news accounts of it. You're hearing it firsthand. You don't need to hear it uh, translated from somebody else. Um, be back tomorrow morning, 8.45. It worked all right this morning. Parking arrangements, that, that's all, all okay. So it'll be the same plan in the morning, 8.45. And... Uh, uh, anybody confused about what's expected of you? If not, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Have a good evening. Um, um, I'd be seated. Any, anybody have any issues? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Earlier we were talking about Dr. Michael Price and having to do a hearing for his testimony. Apparently it's a conflict that he just let us know today with another homicide that's going down in Tampa. We are actually trying to move his testimony up into Tomorrow should be in the afternoon, but I know we still have to have that hearing on whether or not he can testify to the of the current. Um, we're trying to make the plane reservations now. I'm not sure exactly when he's going to arrive. Um, I don't anticipate that hearing will last all day long. Maybe perhaps at lunch. We should have lunch here in order to do that hearing prior to the testimony. Uh, well, let's have a plan, but before we take a lunch break, yes. uh, I mean, you know, if we just have to give the jury a little bit longer lunch break. That doesn't bother me. What I don't want them doing is sitting back in the jury room while we're working on something like that. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I wouldn't think it's going to be all that 
complicated in terms of testimony wise, um, but um, uh, do you think we have to present any other testimony, Mr. Prince, to make a determination? I don't really know what he's going to say, to be honest, about why he would be able to use a frequency of occurrence table for unrelated individuals for comparison of related individuals. So I don't know that I can answer that right this second time. Okay. Well, I'm going to be prepared to make a decision. So if you want somebody else here to, yes. for me to. Uh, here, better have them here, but um, if we don't, like I say, I, I don't want the jury sitting in the jury room either. Anything else? There you are. Um, Y'all need to kind of sort out what's in evidence or not in the evidence and so forth, so let's, let's get that worked out. I think it's a little confused at this point in time, um, but let's get that worked out. Um, anything else? There you are. We actually had this conversation with Mr. Prince um, a little while ago, and I think we agree with the record. Uh, what is not admitted in those numbers, 39 is I'm not it, telling me, and go help and say, uh, okay. you can work it out with the clerk and get it on the list. So, uh, I was trying to put it on the record, Your Honor. Okay. All right. Uh, 39 is not admitted, 98 is not admitted, 100 is not admitted, 115, 116. 117, I'm sorry, 39 is admitted, I apologize. 98 is not, 100 is not, 115 is not, 115 is not, 116 is not, 117 is not, and 118 is not. All right, so 98, 100, 115, 116, 117, and 118, you are not offering into evidence. Is not that? Not that's correct. And beyond that, it would be 1 through 146, um, other than those six exhibits. Uh, one moment, there may be one more. That should be it, um, other than one that all right, yeah, the clerk has given me there are four additional numbers that don't have an exhibit at this point in time. 4, 24, 89, 125, 134, and 144. Yes. So there will not be exhibits for those six numbers at this point in time. Correct, Mr. Prince here up on that. Yes, sir. Okay. All right. See y'all at 8.30.